There we go. Okay, good morning, everybody. Welcome to another National Geographic Learning webinar. My name is Andrew. I'm a Senior Academic Consultant here at National Geographic Learning, and today we're going to be taking a look at teaching systematic synthetic phonics and the Nelson Decodable Readers. We'll talk more about those things as we go. So uh, as I said, my name is Andrew. Um, I've taught a lot of different programs, including not just foreign language programs, but English medium of instruction programs as well. And one thing about the materials we're looking at today is they can really apply to any learner because we're talking about developing beginning literacy. OK, so we're talking about it no matter whether they're a first language user of English or a second, third, fourth language user of English. It's going to apply the same. Uh, it just depends on what stage the students are at their literacy journey in English. OK, uh, just a note about the chat settings. I think everybody's got it, but just make sure if you haven't done that already, just switch it over. OK, very good. So uh, there is the Q&A function. As I mentioned, I've got some colleagues helping me to monitor that today. Feel free to use it. OK, hello, Sammy. OK, very good. So, uh, yeah, teaching systematic synthetic phonics. So what we're going to do today, uh, today is not just a model lesson, as we've uh, often do in the past when we're looking at different programs. Uh, we're going to talk about the idea of phonics today as well and teaching it. And then we're going to look at some examples from uh, a series of books called The Nelson Decodable Readers. I've picked one in particular, which is this one called Ten Kids and a Pup. Uh, and then we'll also talk about uh, some other activities and things as well to do with phonics, because hopefully today you get some ideas, no matter whether you're doing this kind of reader or other readers with phonics, that they may give you some good ideas for activities to do with your learners. But first, we need to talk about systematic synthetic phonics and what it is, OK? Now, I've put the definitions of the three words up there. So you can look at those and kind of see what you feel about them. But basically, phonics is learning to read and write, OK? It's a method of teaching students to read and write, OK? Uh, if it's synthetic, that means we're building it up. We're constructing the phonics. Uh, that means that... Uh, it might be, it might not be a natural kind of approach uh, because it's synthetic. We're essentially building the learning of the student's phonics abilities as we go. And then when it is systematic, we're doing things in a very specific order. OK, so in the chat box, just let me know, has anyone used or do you feel that you use this kind of phonics approach? OK, do you feel you use a systematic synthetic phonics approach? Yes or no? Um, an alternative to teaching literacy and reading might be to do it as a whole word approach. That's another method of teaching reading. OK, so in the chat box, let me know, do you feel like that you use a systematic synthetic phonics approach with reading? OK, so Charmaine's saying phonics, yes, systematic, maybe no. OK, Catherine says, I did when I was in the States, but Japan is a bit different. OK, Moisa says sometimes. OK, Andrew says yes, for phonics. Yep, phonics all the time. OK, so I think a lot of us um, in EFL, phonics is often a core section of the materials or the books that we use. Right. Um, it's not uh, unfamiliar to us as teachers, I think. Right. But maybe the idea of it being synthetic and very systematic might be slightly different. OK. Uh, does anyone know the names of any particular systematic synthetic phonics approaches or uh, systems that are out there? I know of two or three. OK, uh, there's one or two I know from the UK that have a particular name. And then there's others uh, that are out there associated with different companies or different uh, organizations. Right. Would words their way count, says Catherine. Now, Catherine, if you change your chat options, everyone can see. Uh, I'm not actually familiar with words their way. Uh, so maybe it does. I'm not sure. Jolly Phonics, Kitty. Yes, Jolly Phonics is a way of having a very systematic, synthetic, structured phonics, right? OK, very good. That's one. OK, uh, I also learned about some ideas called uh, like sat pin phonics is another one. If you know sat pin, it's very similar to jolly phonics. And what you will find is that a lot of these systems are similar. OK, they're following a, a, uh, a typical kind of system, a way to get the students producing words quickly and easily. OK, so yeah, jolly phonics is a good example. OK, 
Right. So when we're doing this, what we're doing is we're guiding learners through a carefully sequenced uh, organ organization of essential phonics skills. OK, uh, if it's supported by appropriate reading material as well, we've got to make sure that what we're giving the students to actually practice this with is appropriate, right? That the leveling is correct. It's not involving too many things the students don't yet know. OK, then we get this very smooth transition. We get a nice flow as the students learn to read and then eventually they can progress towards those more complex texts. OK, uh, just be aware, of course, that when we're doing this, we're doing this for younger learners. We're doing this for five, six, maybe seven year olds. OK, so we're doing this at the very beginning stages of learning to read in English. OK, it's typically when this happens. OK, now from the Nelson Decodable Readers site, this is their scope and sequence document. It's actually half of it. OK, the link is here and I'll ask one of my colleagues if they could drop the uh, the link uh, that I provided earlier into the channel. Thank you, Will. OK, um, but this is an example of the order in which these phonics are introduced to the students. And by doing it in a specific order and by providing appropriate readers, we can make sure that the students are able to look at a page of the, the reader and they're able to produce as close to 100% of that as possible from what they know, okay? And that's one thing about the Nelson Decodable Readers and other ones like this is it has a very uh, purposeful way of going about this, okay? It makes can make the learners very successful very quickly with their phonics, okay? So if you're interested in this, go check out that document. You can find it on the Nelson website, and it's got a very nice structure there that, that they share about how they teach these things. OK, uh, in the books as well, often you will find different activities like these ones. OK, I'll be going through a couple of these ideas today, uh, but these are teacher's notes that help you with different skills. OK. Um, and as we're doing all of these things, we're building a foundation for phonics. OK, so the four or five things that usually I think about when I'm teaching phonics, the first one is pronunciation. OK, at the bottom end of the ladder, I want my students to be able to produce the sounds. At the moment, I don't care about the text. I don't care about the phonics link between the sounds and text or letters and sounds. I don't worry about that. At the beginning, it's just, can I get you to produce the sounds correctly? OK, so if I say, like C-A-T, then what would that word be? I don't care if, about the reading side. I just want the students to be able to say cat correctly and not kit or dit or something else. I want them to be able to say cat, okay? After that, then we start working on phonemic awareness. That's when we start to understand the different sounds that make up the words, okay? Uh, there's a lot of different activities for this. I'll show you some later on, okay? Uh, then we start working on taking text and turning it into sound, okay? And that's essentially reading, okay? We're looking at text, we're producing the sounds using our phonemic awareness skills, and we're able to produce the sounds, okay? Then we can do that in the reverse order. We can take the sounds and turn it back into text. So that's your foundations in spelling, okay? Uh, and also maybe just identification, like if I say this, which word is it? Uh, on the page or in the book. Uh, and eventually that leads to writing as well, because as with many young learners, what we do is we say, if you can say it, you can write it, right? If you can say it, you can sound it out, then you can write those things down. Okay, now as we're going through phonics, we're working on literacy skills. So we also want to look at things like high frequency words, OK, um, what's a high frequency word in the chat box? What is a high frequency word? OK, uh, we're also looking at text features. We're looking at the images in the books. We're looking at all of these other things as well that go into reading. OK, but in the chat box, what's a high frequency word? Some people have um, different understandings of this. So I'm just making sure that people know what they are. So Catherine says sight words. OK, yep. What else? Uh, Charmaine gave an example, the. OK, that's a high frequency word indeed. Any other idea? Uh, the, uh, and different pronouns. Uh, Joseph saying dolch, he means the dolch list. OK, yep. Uh, Chong says high frequency words means words that cannot be pronounced by using phonics. OK, that's one way that people often think about it. But high frequency words do include phonetically pronounceable words. OK, as well as non-phonetic words. So high frequency words includes both. 
And as Dallin says, it's the words that we most typically see on texts, right? They're very, very common words where we want the students to build up their automaticity of being able to say those words quickly. So if they see T-H-E, they know straight away it's the. If they see A-M, even though it's phonetic, straight away they know it's am. OK, so we want the students to build up this um, this fluency, this automaticity by making sure they've got a good set of high frequency words that doesn't slow them down if they're trying to decode them all or work them out as they go. OK, yeah. So as Lillian says, words that are used frequently, not necessarily phonetically easy. Some are, some aren't. OK, but these are all things that we're going to look at as we're working on Fox. Great. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into uh, using some of the materials now. Now, just to let you know, uh, unlike some of our um, National Geographic Learning programs, this program doesn't come from National Geographic Learning directly. It comes from our partner within the bigger company that we work for. Uh, the bigger company is called Cengage Group, and Nelson is the group that produces the uh, the Nelson Decodable Readers, hence the name, okay? Uh, so they don't have a classroom presentation tool exactly the same as the ones you've seen us use before, but I'm going to go through and do some activities with the digital resources here today. Um, the other one is this is a phonics lesson, and you can't talk to me. Um, so what I'm going to have to show you today is some activities and ideas that where I'm doing pretty much all of the speaking. I'm not going to ask my colleagues to jump in and make them act like five-year-olds. It's okay, um, even though they could speak on camera for me. Um, I'll, I'll show you some different things uh, where I'm doing most of the, the producing, um, and maybe in the chat box you can help with the identification ideas, and we'll talk about some other activities later. So a bit of model and a bit of, bit of discuss today. Okay, good. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch my screen. And I'm going to go to here. So this is our book for today, but actually I want to go to this page to start with. This is uh, the kind of the teacher's bookshelf for the Nelson Decodable Readers. And as you can see, there's a lot of different things here, but I'm going to kind of use this like a little bit of a presentation tool today. Okay, very good. So we're going to do a little activity to start off. Okay, and for this little activity, you're going to tell me which uh, letter to pronounce, and then I'm going to say it, and you're going to tell me whether or not I'm producing that sound correctly. Okay, so this is just a basic phonemic awareness kind of thing. Okay, so can someone in the chat box give me a row and a number in that row? So if you said row one, number two, that would be the letter S. Okay, so Charmaine Sen set to number six. I have to move the chat box. So that is the letter H. So if I say, is that correct? Is that correct? Yes, good one. Thank you, Bankita. Okay, can someone give us another one? Give us one more. Give me one more. Four, number three, says Diana. Okay, so that's the letter V, right? So do I say V like... Is that correct? So Andrew says no. Okay. No, it's not. It is. Okay. What's the difference? What's the difference? So if I put my fingers on here and I go, can I feel anything? No, I can't. But if I go, can I feel it? Yeah, I can. Right? Okay. So for my students, maybe that way. Okay. Now we're going to switch over. This time I'm going to say one and you have to tell me which which row and which column that one is in. So if I say er, 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 which one is it? Two, number three, very good, okay. If I say d, 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 and this one is vibrating, d, 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 which one is it? Three, one, very good, okay. If I say now, this is a little tricky <laughs> because of my phonics, right? Okay, so if I say, which sound am I trying to make? Eh. 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 Okay, good. One, number five. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Because I'm originally from New Zealand, and with my New Zealand accent, some people confuse when I say different words. Like if I say this thing here and I say it's a pen, sometimes people think I'm saying it's a pin, right? Uh, and that's because of my phonics, my own phonics, right? Don't worry about phonics too much. Uh, accents happen on the vowels, 
your students will live with it. There are a lot of Englishes in the world, right? Okay, good. So we've done that little activity. Okay, what we're going to do now is we're going to jump over to the book, okay? But I've kind of warmed my students up for today. Okay, so let's take a look at the book. This is our book. Mm, what does it say? What does it say the book is here? It says 10 kids and a pup. Now, I can actually play the sound. Let me just check. I've got the sound shared, which I do. Let's listen. 10 Kids and a Pup by Debbie Croft. Now, what accent does that sound like to you? What accent did that sound like? English or New Zealand, British? For me, I can... Uh, uh, Andrew's saying Oz. Okay, he means Australian, right? It is an Australian accent. Uh, it's it's actually voiced. It's not a robot, Moises. It is actually a person, but they're, they're enunciating quite clearly. Um, it is an Australian accent. Uh, so as we go through today, uh, the voice actor in this uh, that's going through these materials is an Australian uh, because Nelson is an Australian company. It's based in Australia. Uh, and um, this, just so you know, this version of the material I'm using is a, a mid, midway prototype. There are some inconsistencies consistencies, which we'll talk about later, and we'll use them as bad examples, okay, later on. Okay, but let's take a look at the cover of the book. This is the cover. Now, what can you see on the cover? What kind of, what things can you see on the cover? We can see some kids. How many kids? How many kids can you see? Ten. Very good. Okay, there is a dog, a pup. Yeah, very good. What else can you see? What else can you see? Teachers, maybe, yeah. Two adults, yeah, man and a woman. Cool. Yep. A backyard, yeah, maybe. Yeah. Some adults, good. A hat, very good. Erwin, there is a hat. What color is the hat? What color is the hat? It's a red hat. That's right. We will look at that one later. There's orange. Where's the orange? Oh, orange is on the, whoops, on the shirt down here. Yeah. The jacket. Yeah. Do we know the names of some other things here? What's this gray and black thing here? What's that? What's that gray and black thing there? This gray and black thing. A fence. Very good. Yeah, I can't use my digital pen on this one today, unfortunately. Right. Uh, what about this gray, big gray thing here? What's this? Yeah, a house or a wall. Very good. OK. What about the stuff here? What's this green stuff at the bottom here? Grass, very good. Okay, good. So we got some different things. Now, why would I do that in this lesson? It's because these are still early language learners, uh, beginning readers. It's good for them to uh, recognize and hear different words and associate the words they know with objects. Uh, and eventually they'll also do that with text. Okay, so it's good. Just gets, the, gets everybody going. Now, what do you think might happen in this story? What do you think will happen? Does anyone have an idea? What might happen? Knowing the pup, the dog is lost. Maybe they will adopt the pup. They will take care of the pup. Yeah, right? Yeah. Could be. Any others? Okay, those are good. We've got some ideas, right? Yeah, 10 kids and a pup. Hmm. Might be a field trip. Good. Maybe they play with the pup. Very good. OK, so let's take a look into the story. I need to move the chat window. There we go, because the controls are off to the side here. OK, so we've got the cover. Now, before we read the book, we're going to look at all the pictures really quickly. OK, so I'm going to look at the pictures very fast and we're going to see what we see about the story. OK, are you ready? So here's number one. Here's number two. Here's number three. Number four, number five, number six, number seven, number eight, and then we're at the end. Okay, so don't worry about what's on the screen at the moment. What did you see in the story? What things did you see happen? What things did you see happen? And I'm going to quickly go back to the beginning. <laughs> What did you see happen? Who can get the pup, says Alan, maybe, yeah. Some kids find a pup, yeah, maybe. 
be a prize. Why do you say it's a prize? What did you see? They had to draw lots. Okay. Yeah. Pulling names out of the hat, right? Yeah. They want the pup. Yeah, right? Okay. So as we go through, we're going to take a look at all of those things and see what we see. But before we do today's reading, we need to practice some words before we start. So before we start reading, let's go and review our words. We're going to switch screens. We're going to go over here. We're actually going to start with some letters to start with. We're going to start with some letters. Now, in class, I can't do this with you because you can't pronounce them right, but this would be obviously an activity where we're going to review the sounds and review some words, okay? So the first ones here is just letters. Uh, for number two, I wrote capital L, just to be obvious that it's an L and not an I or the number one, okay? But then I would just go through. So what's number one? Okay, uh, which one is w, w, w? Which one is w, 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 number five? Good. And we can do some different activities with this, okay? Now, just a note about number four. Um, how would you pronounce number four as an isolated letter? Would you say qu or would you say k for number four? So some of us would do qu and some of us might do the. Why would we do one or the other? When I was originally doing phonics or learning phonics, I got taught uh, to say qua because Q always comes with a U, right? And so qua, like quiet, quack, things like that. Um, there are occasionally words like U where it's a k sound and not a qua sound. So, but I guess in the beginning, let's keep it easy and go qua. I think most teachers would go qua. I just raised that question. Very good. Okay. So if we jump down, that's the letters. We'd review those. Then we would review some words. Okay. And I could go through these ones. Okay. So we've got kids. Okay. And for these ones, I'd break it down. So um, question, when you break down words, if I, let's, let's do number two, just because number two is a little easier to, to break down. It's only got three phonemes and not four. Um, but if you were doing number two, would you break it down from the front or would you break it down from the back? Or would you do it some other way? How would you segment the word, as, as someone is saying here? Some would say from the front. So you would go, e, mm, him, right? Okay. Pity says she would do, mm, then, e, mm, im, then, im, him, right? Why would you do it that way? Why might we do it? A different way. In fact, when I often teach it, what I do, I'll show you what I do, I would review with the students, I. then I would go im, then I would go him, right? Now, why might I do it that way? Or why might you say, I always start at the front? What do you think? Yeah, so Alan, why vowel first? Why might we do that? Any ideas? Most important sound could be, yeah. I mean, for me, the way I got taught to think about it was that this one is really, really important to not be confused with other vowels, right? Um, especially when you've got a New Zealand accent like, like me and E and I and A can sometimes all sound the same. Um, um, but the reason I do this one, okay, before I do the K, this is when I'm teaching the pronunciation. This is not reading, right? We'll talk about reading in a second. But for pronunciation or phonics, I do it this way because I want the students to say im, not im, okay? I don't want them to carry on with the, the sound, right? This person's name is him, not him, okay? So we, that's why I got taught and I have usually followed this idea of making sure the final consonant is pronounced correctly by focusing on it early, okay? And then after that, then I would do this. However, when we're reading, I think we'd all agree that we go from left to right. We go mm, him, right? We go that way, okay? So different people will do it different ways. Just be aware different things happen, right? Um, but think about how you do that with your students. A couple of the reasons, again, like him is one. Um, how many times in different countries might you hear this one pronounced as book, right? No, it's a book, right? Not book, 
right? And the classic one for me was when I used to teach in Taipei, <clears throat> this word, uh, a lot of the kids would pronounce it with three syllables. They would say, teacher, it's six, sir. Right? <laughs> um, no, it's six, right? <laughs> so, okay. So, yeah, you've got to got to figure out how to get the students to pronounce well, right? And so these are some ways that you might do that. Okay. Now, some other things we might do as we're going through this, just some little ideas that we might do, is we might talk about which words rhyme here or which words are very similar. Okay. So which two words are very similar here? Maybe there's only one letter or one sound difference. Okay. Yeah, so maybe win and wins. Yep. Well, him and win, there's actually two differences, isn't there? So, and what is different, and m mm and n mm is different at the end, right? But what about sal and vowel, right? There's only one letter difference. What difference is there? One is s and one is m, mm, right? They're different, right? Yeah. Good, right? Okay. So these ones, and sometimes I teach my students the, the name or the, the phrase minimal pair, right? Um, but otherwise, it's just like, just say they're, they're very similar or they're almost the same. Okay. Very good. Um, you could also do win and wins as, as different ones. And these ones are important because it doesn't sound like an S, does it? It sounds more like a Z, right? So we don't say wins, right? It's wins, right? Same for kids. Right? It's the same thing. Okay? But anyway, we would run through these ones. Okay? And then after that, we would go through and we would look at, in the book, they call them challenge words, but these are typically your high frequency words. Okay? And again, we could look at these ones and we could say, can you find some things that are similar about these words? Which two words do you think are similar here? And why are they similar? Why are they similar? Two and two, yeah. So number two, number two and number ten are the same sound but different spelling, right? Very good. What else is similar? Me and we, yeah. Very good. So they're a minimal pair, okay? Me and we, okay. What about number two and number seven? What's similar and what's different? Number two and number seven. Yeah, so the first letter is different, and the sounds, very good, are different. They both have an O, but one is two, and the other one is no, not nu, right? It's not toe and no, it's not two and nu, <laughs> it's two and no, right? Okay. Uh, we could also talk about how maybe we and went both have W-E, but it sounds different, et cetera, et cetera, right? But this is getting the students familiar with the sounds and producing and practicing them as well, okay? We'll talk about some other activities we can do with these kinds of words later on, okay? Four and six. So Colin, why are four and six similar? or different? What's going on with number four and number six? Can you explain? I'll give you a second. And while you're doing that, I am going to switch back to the book. Now, ah uh, and the, very good. I like it, the sounds, right? Depending on how you pronounce, right? Uh, but yeah, ah uh, and the, very good. I like that. Well done, Colin. Very cool. Okay, now, what we're going to do is I'm going to slightly minimize this window like this and get it in the right spot. And before we read, last thing we do before we read, I need to reshare my screen because I need to make sure you're seeing everything I want you to see, which is like this. Should be like that, I believe. Let me just double check that. Looks good. Okay, so what I want you to do is we're going to quickly look at the pages, and I want you to tell me which of these words do you see on the page, okay? So, for example, on this page, which of our challenge words can you see? So we can see a, uh, okay, as the challenge word, okay? Good, right. What about this page here? Now, every time I do this, I need to, oh, come on. There we go. I need to do that to go back to, back to the right sharing thing, okay? Good, so we've got went. What else do we have? What else do we have? A, uh, good. Who and look. Very good. We've got four on this page. We'll do one more. Let's look at this one. I have to bring back this up again. There we go. 
Okay, so on this one, which words do we have? On this page, said, good, and the, right? Said and the. So again, what I might do here is I'm really breaking this down so that the students get a lot of exposure to these special words, these challenge words, before we actually go and read. Okay, very good. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to just the book. Go back to here. We'll get rid of that other window. And I just need to move some stuff around a little bit. Okay, the Zoom window gets in the road. Let's go back to the beginning and read 10 Kids and a Pup. Now, in the books, these ones are nice because you can play the audio. Okay, but we can also look at specific words as we go. So as we go, 10 kids went to look at a pup. Okay, and I can model the right kind of pronunciation and fluency and pacing as we go. OK, uh, maybe I go back and I do it again in a much more fluent way. Ten kids went to look at a pup. OK, and then on a particular word, I might want to focus on it. Maybe this one. Right. Let's have a listen. Let's listen to the word. T -e -n ten. Does that sound good? Did she say it the right way? Does it sound good? E -n. Ten. Yeah, that sounds pretty good, right? Okay, well, let's try this one. Let's try P-U-P. -P. Let's listen. P -a -p pup. Pup. Does that sound good? good? Yeah, okay. Sounds pretty good. Okay, let's all read together. Ten kids went to look at a pup. Okay, very good. And I can isolate individual words. I can say, what's word number five? Can you read word number five to me? What's word number five? Look, very good. What's word number two? Word number two, kids. Very good, okay? Um, one thing you might find, and we'll talk about this in a minute, is after a while the kids are not looking at the page and they're just saying, oh, 10 kids went to look at a pup because they know the story. We'll talk about some ways to deal with that, but I want your ideas too, okay? Let's look at another one. Okay, so let's look at this one. Let's listen. Dad said Kim can get the pup. Very good. Okay, let's look at number five. How do we say number five? How do we say number five? Get. Very good. Okay, can we hear, Claire's asking, can we hear how she sounds out the high frequency words? So let's do the, right? Let's, let's listen. The, uh, the. Okay, what about said? Said. Said. Okay. Good. So how does that sound? So there she's focusing on the phonemes, not the individual letters, right? But what did you think about this one? Listen to this one again. S-e-d. Said. Hmm. Does that one sound perfect to you? Sounds good. S-e-d. Said technically. <laughs> so Kitty's saying D dash. What does Kitty mean by D dash? Yeah, so this is said. She did say the S correctly and the E correctly, like said, right? But the D sound, it kind of dragged on, didn't it? Let's listen again. S-E-D. Said. Because we don't say said, do we? Mm, yeah. So some of these, what you may find in audio like this, uh, there may be occasions when there's, there's things that are not quite right in any materials, right? And so I use those as examples with my students and say, let's see, can we make it better, right? So let's try this one. Get. Let's listen. G -e -t. Get. Mm, what did you think of that one? Was there any letter? Were there any letters that sounded a little wrong to you? Listen one more time. G, E, T, get. Yeah, so Colin is saying the G is G, right? Okay, so maybe we can be like G, not G, okay, for this one. So G, E, T, get, right? G, E, T, mm. get. The G might be a little bit, a little bit, because we don't say G, E, T, right? Okay, so these are things to watch out for with phonics, and like why I said at the beginning, I focus a lot on pronunciation, Okay. Very good. As Will says in the chat box, it's very difficult to completely isolate the phonemes, right? And these are skills that the kids need to work on too. Okay, good. We'll look at one more page. Okay, what is this boy's name? How do we say this name? So if I say not, is this not? Is that right? Not. No. Okay. Is it, is it nat? 
Nat, does that sound right? Nat. Yeah, that sounds better. Okay. What about this word? This one, L-E-T. Mm. Is this met? Is this met? Met? No. Is it live? Live? <laughs> no. Is it lead? Lead? No, it's not. Okay, is it lit? Lit? Okay, we're getting better, right? Okay, good. Let. 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 Very good, right? So that one's better. Okay, so obviously we can go through the whole story like this. But as we're going through the story, Nat said, no, said Nat. Let me get the pup. Why did he say that? We can go into the story as well. We can actually talk about the story as we're going. Why does he say no? What happened on the last page? We didn't read it super thoroughly, did we? Dad said Kim can get the pup. Nat says, no, let me get the pup. Why does he say no? Why does he say no? Because he wants it. Yeah, he wants the pup. What about the next page? What happens on the next page? Mum, can we get the pup? Said Win and Sal. So in Win and Sal, uh, Sal, right? Mum said Win and Sal can get the pup. Okay, hang on a minute. Tim, Nat, Win and Sal. How many people? How many people? Four kids want the pup. So what should we do? Should we take the pup and cut it into four pieces, one piece each? No, why not? <laughs> one leg each. <laughs> okay, so what can we do? What can we do? If you want something and your friend wants something and your other friend wants something, what can we do? What can we do? Right? Take turns, yeah, we can take turns. We can share, good, right? Paper, scissors, stone. Yes, maybe. Right? Draw lots. Yeah. One kid keep the pup for a week or for a day. Someone said Monday to Sunday, right? Yeah. So these are ways we can get the students to think about some of these other maybe social and emotional learning skills along with what's going on in the story as well. Right? So there's always ways you can add more ideas into any story. Okay? Very good. So what actually happens? Everybody wants the pup. Everybody wants the pup. So what do they do? Ten kids want ten kids and a pup. Mum got her big red hat. Mm, okay. So what color is it? It's red. What what sounds do you hear in red? What sounds do you hear? Now in the chat box, you're just going to type R and E and D, right? Yeah. So we hear R and E, D, right? So all these keywords we can break down as we go. Okay. Very good. And then we draw lots. Now, what names can you see here? What names can you see? So there's 10 names at the top. We've got M, Nat, Win, Sal, Val, Min, Meg, Rob, Liv, John. Okay. And here we can see one, two, three, four, five names. So if I say one of the 10 names, can you see that name? Yes, you can see it. Or no, you can't in the hat. Okay. So if I say Min, Min, can you see Min in the hat? No. We cannot, right? Can you see Sal in the hat? Sal. Yes, we can. Good. Can you see him? Him in the hat? Him. Yes, we can see Kim. Can you see John? John in the hat? No, we can't, right? And so what I'm getting the students is I'm getting them to read text in other formats, right? The text there is a little crazy, but they can still recognize it, right? Very good. Okay. And eventually, who wins the pup? Kim wins the pup. Okay. Yay, Kim. How do you think everybody else feels? How do the others feel? Are they happy? Are they sad? They're sad? Why? Why are they sad? Envious. That's a big word for a six-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> Justice, or do you mean jealous? Mm. They want the pup too. Disappointed, right? Yeah, they look happy for her. Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe tomorrow mum draws another name from the hat. I don't know, right? Okay, so lots of things we can do. Now, in the back of the book, there are some more activities and things here. So we've got some comprehension activities at the top. 
Okay, we've got vocabulary based activities at the bottom and see here you've got rhyming names and things like minimal pairs. Okay, look at the word went, how many letters are in the word, what sounds are there. So we're really focusing on the phonics in this section and the vocabulary here. And then we've got some more reasoning, a little bit more creative or critical thinking that's going on here. You can see these are open ended questions. What are some different places you can get a pet from? The pet store, a farm, my friend who has hamsters, I don't know, right? So there's lots of different things that we can do uh, as more activities. And then on the next page, there are a few more phonics activities here as well. Okay, cool. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump out of here and we're going to spend the next 10 or 15 minutes just with some other ideas about phonics, some different things you might want to try. Okay, so if I jump away from here, let's run back to here, share. There we go. Um, so we went through the book. We've done some different activities. Let's see on the next pages which ones have I done and what are some other things we can talk about. Okay. Now, with phonemic awareness and building up phonic skills, uh, there are some good frameworks you can use for this. Um, phonemic awareness is really that ability to notice the sounds, to work with the sounds, but also think about it. It's like meta language, right? We're thinking about what's going on with these words. Um, so there's a lot of manipulation of those phonemes that we're going to do as part of this, okay? There's a lot of different practice activities you can do, okay? Um, I asked before about things about minimal pairs and things like that, and I want to know what ideas you have about that as well, okay? Um, but here is a framework. Now, this image I sourced from this link, okay? Uh, and if you just look for phonemic awareness and you do an image search on Google or something like that, you will find this image or something very similar. I could not find the original source of this image. Where I found it was on, uh, on a website talking about speech therapy, okay? But these activities, these 12 activities here in kind of a scaffold, I find really, really good for doing with my students when we're doing phonics and phonemic awareness. So much that I put this on the wall and in my classroom somewhere so that I can look at it and go, right, today I'm doing number seven. And just reminds me of the different activities, okay? So at the beginning, step one on this chart was things like just understand the sounds. What happens when you make that sound? So like, like saying d and t. And what's the difference, right? Where's my tongue? Things like that, okay? Um, part two is putting basic words together to make compound words, especially. This is just getting the idea that you can put things together, right? So rainbow, rainbow, okay? Um, you could say something like pencil case, pencil case. I mean, that's technically two words, but okay. Um, you could break up other words like that from syllables, but often something like rainbow is a good one to put together to give the students that idea. Okay. Okay. Um, another one is uh, one syllable words. Um, so then we're breaking or blending these things together as we did here. Okay. So b uh, g bug, right? OK, then we're starting to recognize the different sounds and what's the same and what's different. Right. I did a few of those sorts of things as well. OK, so here we've got thin and then and how they're different. Right. Um, segmenting words. So the reverse of number three, we take the word and we break it up. OK. Um, isolating sounds. So maybe an initial sound. OK, uh, could be. Um, isolating the final or the middle sound as well, right? Uh, change the initial sound, right? So we often do that, right? Give me another word that rhymes with at. Okay, so can't, hat, that, mat, fat, blah, 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 right? Okay, um, isolate the final sound, and we could do the same thing with the final sound. So we could go block, blog, um, what else? The blood doesn't work, does it? <laughs> There's not many with blah at the start, right? Okay, okay. Um, and then we can change the final sound. So met, mess, men, um, meg, um, what else have we got? Med, I don't know, lots of different things, right? Blot, thank you, Will. <laughs> okay, um, isolate the medial vowel, the middle vowel. So if I say a word like um, hen, like this thing, what's the middle vowel sound? It's e, 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 right? If I say fish, fish, what's the middle vowel sound? It's e, 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 right? And so on and so on, okay? Blending other things together, especially if it's a two-syllable word and the two parts or the two syllables are phonetically regular, that's that's a good one to do. Trickier to find some words like that sometimes, but it's a good one. 
Okay, um, and then rhyming one syllable words and working with blends. So here you've got things like cart, part, smart, art. Um, you could even do things like um, smart, smell, smidgen, whatever, right? Um, so you could do those sorts of things with different uh, blends as well as you go through. Okay, so lots of different activities here. Now, which ones did you see me do today of this list? Which ones did I do when I was going through the book? I really like this chart, like I say, because it just gives you tons of things to do, right? After a while, of course, you probably just remember all of these activities, but it's a good reminder sometimes. Yeah, I did number five. I broke things up, right? I didn't do all of them. Uh, I didn't do a lot of the ones at the top, for example. Like I didn't uh, no, do number 10. I didn't isolate a medial vowel, right? Um, I did do some isolating of beginning sound, final sound. Um, we did look at... Um, Recognizing differences, number four. Okay. Um, so we did some of these. We didn't do all of them. Uh, yeah, we did number one when I was doing this thing, right? Um, with T and D, for example. Okay. Or V and F. Okay. So these are some different things that we can do. Okay. Good. Now, some other things is about the high frequency words. Now, someone earlier mentioned the Dolch list. I use the Fry list. The Dolch list is older. Um, comes from like the 30s, I believe. Uh, the Fry list is used in uh, regular grade school in America, for example. Um, this little note comes from uh, how it fits to Common Core State Standards. And it's talking about how grade levels, kindergarten and first grade, would use the first 100 words in the Fry list. Um, the expectation uh, for the Fry list, there are a thousand words in the overall Fry list. The expectation is by the end of grade two, in a first language user situation, America, Canada, whatever, um, that the students would know the first 200, okay, by the end of grade two. So they don't need to know all thousand, right? Um, there's the link. You can just search for fry list. You'll find it easily enough, right? Um, but there are, there's the hundred words. They're broken up into lists as well. So each hundred is broken up into groups of 25. And I do a lot of things with my students around these words. Um, so uh, I'll give you a couple of examples in a moment, but one thing I would do, for example, um, um, is just a lot more practice based on what we already know, okay? Uh, now, we talked about minimal pairs earlier. What are some minimal pairs activities you do with your students? So, for example, when you're comparing words like um, win and min, or when you're comparing words like pin and pen, or when you're comparing words like um, fat and fan. What do you do for minimal pairs? What kind of activities do you do? Tap and tape? Yep, that's an example, right? Okay. What kind of activities do you do with them? Rhyming? Yes. Okay, so we can do lots of rhyming activities. Okay, give me a word that rhymes with bill. Okay, so bin, uh, sorry, kill, for example, right? OK, a memory game. Yeah, we can have like a memory chain of words. Good. Touch the wall. So, Colin, do you mean like a left wall, right wall, kind of based on which sound? Or do you have flashcards on the wall and go to the flashcard of the thing you hear? Is it something like that for touch the wall? Postcards on the wall. Yeah, good, good. Sorting. Yeah, Ivy, that's a good one. Give the kids lots of words on flashcards or, or just tiny word cards and they can sort them into rhyming pairs or minimal pairs. Yep. Swap the pair. Good. Yep. Lots of things like that, right? Lots and lots of different things you can do with minimal pairs. I tend to do a lot of physical jumping and moving around ones as well. So maybe I am focusing on vowel sounds. Okay. And maybe I've got a, ah, e, and u as three vowel sounds that I'm putting on. I put them on the board, maybe. And then I get the students to be like in a line, right? And then I say something like, I'm going to say a word. And when you hear that sound, jump to that cue. Right. So if, if it's like eh, 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 and I say hat, then they're all going to jump over to here. OK. And if I say pin, then they're all going to jump over to this one. Right. And so on. OK. So you can do a lot of things with minimal pairs like that and make it active. Collins one I like because the kids are moving as long as it's safe then it's good. Um, if you've got a lot of students, maybe Colin's example, rather than putting the words on the wall, maybe on the desk, you have like a chart or something and the kids are playing like finger twister, right? By touching the touching the letters of the things they hear. Okay, good. Um, another one's phonics transformation. That's just taking words as we saw. It's one of those activities, taking words and changing, right? Okay, so if I say min, 
Min, m -i -n, min. Give me another word where you change one letter, one sound. Min. Yeah. It's a more peaceful game. That's true, Colin. Okay. Pin. Good. Okay. So let's take pin and change it to something else. Pin. Tin. So Sammy said sin. Okay. Let's change something that's not the first part of the word. Sin. Let's take sin and change it into something else. Sin. Sit, good Colin, yeah, or sip, good, right? And so we're doing this just phonics transformation one letter at a time, okay? Good, so that's a good example, right? Uh, race the clock. Now, race the clock I can do with a lot of different things. Um, it's basically, it's a pronunciation activity, but let me describe the way I do it with something like the fry list. So what I often do with my students is I give them like a little log book or a little um, page that they can keep track of things on. And I will get them to go through uh, lists. Oh, there's only half of the list there. There's the other half. Um, I will get them to go through the list, okay, and time themselves. I get them to do it in pairs. So one is timing, the other one is saying. So for example, they'll go through the list and they will say, ready, go. The, of, and, are, to, in, is, you, that, it, he, was, for, on, are, as, with, his, they, I, at, be, this, have, from, stop. Okay. And then they write down their time. And maybe their time is like 22 seconds. Right. OK. And then the point is that they're going to do a race, but it's not a race against the partner. I don't make my five year olds or six year olds compete against each other in this situation. I just say, do it again and see if you can go faster. OK. Are we ready? Can you go faster? Can you beat your record? Right. Ready, go. The of and are to in is you that it he was for on our as with his they I at be this have from. OK. <laughs> right. And they're trying to go faster and faster and they're building up their recognition and their fluency. OK. Um, after a while, I might say, OK, we're going to change it. So now you've got to go backwards through the list. So from have this be at I they his with da 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 da. Or maybe go left, right, left, right, left, right. So for the on our of as, and with, uh, his, to, blah, 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 down the list, right? The point is that the students are just getting lots and lots of practice doing this kind of thing, okay? And it builds up their automaticity with these words. Then I'll say to them, okay, if you can get list one down to less than 20 seconds, then we're going to also start on list two. When you can get that down to less than 20 seconds, then we're going to do list three and similar. Uh, Colin says you do a similar game with dice. Colin, can you quickly describe your dice game in the chat box? That would be really great because we can sh everybody can learn from you for doing that, right? Each column, one list. Cool. Keep explaining. I'll carry on. Okay. Um, Sentence building. Uh, with sentence building, what I would do is I will print all of the words onto flashcards. I will do something like this. Share. Come on, share. There we go. I will do something like this, where I have a lot of the different words. So all of the blue ones are my uh, fry list high frequency words from the first list. OK, and then down here, I've got my uh, phonetic vocabulary words that were part of the story. And we can get the kids to make sentences. Right now, don't worry about capital letters or, or periods too much at this stage. It's just putting things together. Right. So maybe I'm like, OK, dad, mm, what can we say? Mm, dad is. Uh, dad is a pup. Well, that's a sentence. It's not true. <laughs> but dad is a pup is a sentence. Sure. Why not? Right. OK. And. If I've got a lot of these cards, it's the kind of thing you make once, use many times, where the kids can put together sentences, or maybe one says a sentence and the other one is trying to assemble the sentence. That's good for listening, reading, manipulating things, fine motor skills, all of these sorts of things as well. Does anyone do activities like this as well with word cards? Just while I read Colin's instructions here. Ah, good, Colin. I like your one, right? No competition. Just whoever gets lucky with the easy ones and the hard ones, because you've got some difficult words mixed in, right? Good. Okay. They want to avoid that. Good. But if they can get it, yeah, that's a cool. They've, they've got the challenge word, right? Colin, I like your game. Everybody take note of Colin's game. That's a good one, right? I quite like that. And dice and a little bit of randomness, because kids, kids love these kind of games that make it a bit more adult, right? They love this sort of stuff. 
Yep. But yeah, lots of these things you can do with word cards and manipulating things around, right? Um, I can even see if the kids can do memory chains with this. So if I say, right, hands on your head, I'm going to say five words. You have to try and remember them and you have to try and put them in order. So if I say he, for, I, and, are, oh, then the kids are like, okay, so he, four, was four? That one's four, mm, I, and and R, right? So this way, it's a little bit of memory. There's a bit of reading. There's manipulation. There's a challenge. There's a lot of different things like this that the kids can do. Okay? Good. Okay, let's jump back to here. To here again. Yeah, as Colin says, some kids are competitive. They don't like to lose. But if it's just going against yourself, then you can't really be a loser, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, oops. Another one is find the phonics. Just finding different things in text. Now, a uh, little story about this one. Um, there was uh, a teacher I knew when I worked in Taipei uh, who got his students to, his, his students were um, five-year-old, they were still finishing kindergarten, five-year-old students. He would give them the English newspaper every day and then he would give them a page and he would say, find this phoneme, find this phonic. Can you find these words? Can you find the, how many the words can you find on this page? How many words I in can you find on this page, right? And he would get them to go through looking and circling things on a newspaper or a magazine. And the funny story was there was a new uh, a prospective parent coming into the kindergarten to take a look and see if they wanted to enroll their student, walk past the classroom, looked through the window and saw the five-year-olds with newspapers <laughs> and immediately said, I want my student in that class, <laughs> right? I want my kid in that class, right? Because it's like, didn't understand what was going on, right? But still, it looks good, right? But these are sorts of things where the students get exposed to text and other formats. It could be magazines and books. It could be online text. It could be posters or signs around the, the class or out on the street. Um, it could be like, for example, I uh, used to live in Taipei and there's a place called Family Mart, right? And, um, you know, you would say to the kids things like, oh, you know this one, right? Okay, what letter does it start with? What sound does it make, right? And they would, um, they would, you know, be able to use text in the real world and be able to figure out the sounds of uh, and the pronunciation, right? Yeah, good marketing strategy, right? Yeah. So anyway, different things you can do. So, um, you know, if you've got your kids out and about in the real world and get them to interact with text, even if it's just at that phoneme level, right? It's going to be good for them in the long run. Okay, <laughs> very good. Okay, so I hope that gave you some good ideas of different things you can do with teaching systematic synthetic phonics. Okay, the the phonics part, I've given you a lot of activities today. The systematic and synthetic part, really that comes from having a good reader like the Nelson Decodable Readers. Um, just to give you an idea of how many readers are in that Nelson set, there are a lot. Uh, if I go back to here... Um, in the set that in the bookshelf that Nelson has, you can see they start with all these individual phonemes. But then down here, there are lots of books and phonemes and stuff like that. And if I scroll across, so they're introducing lots of phonemes. If I scroll across in each of these rows, there are lots of readers as well. This takes a second for them to load. But this one has, like in this set, there are 24 things alone, right? There are a lot of resources in the Nelson Decodable Readers materials. OK, so if you're interested, uh, do go check it out. Um, we'll drop the link to the Nelson Decodable Readers website in there uh, so you can take a look. Um, Nelson Decodable Readers, if you're interested, and as Colin said, back to the marketing strategy stuff, these are used in Australian and New Zealand schools. I'm from New Zealand. We used books almost exactly like these, older versions, when I was a student way back in the day. Um, so these sorts of resources are really, uh, you know, they're very international and they're designed for an international audience. Okay. Thank you, guys. Okay, so if I jump back to the main screen, just a couple of notes before we wrap up. Uh, we will send you a certificate tomorrow with the recording link for the session. Um, check your email tomorrow. If you don't get it by afternoon tomorrow, then drop me an email. I'll make sure you get it. Okay.
Uh, upcoming webinar next week, uh, oh sorry, no, a uh, couple of weeks from now, 16th and 17th of April, um, we've got two of our editorial team, um, Don Clyde Bassey and Derek Mackerel, they're going to be doing a session on uh, tips for academic writing success. So this is for older students, um, academic writing, okay, for school-based writing. Uh, you can see the different times and dates there. Do go check out the National Geographic Learning Webinars website and you'll find out more about that. Okay. Thank you, Kitty, for the link in the chat box. But now let's take a look at some questions. I noticed there's a couple in the Q&A box. Um, let's take a quick look at those. So Charmaine's asking, uh, in the context of teaching EFL, at what age do you think students should start learning or teaching reading and phonics? So um, for me, it always depends on... Um, it's like scaffolding, right? Everything's got to be at an appropriate stage. My experience in EFL is often working with students who learned to start speaking English at a kindergarten age, okay? And then as they're going through kindergarten, maybe about the age of five, or maybe four, we start working on individual sounds and letters, but then maybe on five, we're working at blending and actually reading words, okay? You really... Like there's a lot of good science and research that says doing trying to get students to read before the age of five is not really beneficial. It doesn't really help. OK, um, the, the bulk of students, you might have an exceptional learner. Right. But generally speaking, the age of five. However, you don't want what you're doing with reading to outpace their oral skills. Right. So if they're reading uh, sorry, if their speaking vocabulary is only 50 words, you don't really want them to be trying to read this kind of reader like I was doing today. It doesn't mean anything to them when what they're producing through phonics doesn't match with what they know orally. OK, it's not very beneficial to them. If you think of a first language user, by the time a first language user begins to learn to read at the age of five or maybe six, they already have an oral vocabulary in excess of 5,000 words, maybe as many as 10,000 words. OK, there is no way that their reading vocabulary or their reading um, skills are going to surpass their oral vocabulary. Right. So you want to that. That's my biggest advice. Right. Is making sure that what you're doing in reading doesn't outpace their oral uh, vocabulary or their oral skills, okay? Um, the other one is uh, one of our authors, um, uh, well, actually a couple of our different authors, say this basic idea that you learn to read once. You learn to read once, but then you tend to learn to read with different languages. But the idea of learning to read, of taking text and turning it into meaning and sounds, you learn to do that once, with usually with your home language first, right? So you can borrow what the students already know from their home language reading ability in an EFL class. And that could be, it's the same, OK, because maybe some letters and sounds are the same or the text direction is the same, but it might be different as well, because let's say um, I have experience a lot with Chinese speakers and Chinese uh, kids learn to read vertically, right, with Chinese characters as well. Um, but then English, we're working horizontally. So, you know, there can be some differences there as well. OK, and so comparing and contrasting is a good way to look at that. OK, so Charmaine, that's a long answer, but I hope that gives you some ideas. OK, good one. Um, everyone's saying, do C and K have the same sound? Well, there's a few letters in English. English is a weird language, right? C and K have the same sound in some senses, but then other times they don't, because if you put C with an E or an I, then like the word circle, then the two C's have different sounds, right? So depends, right? Um, if you're not sure about that, just go check it out. There's tons of resources talking about um, the, the letters that change their sound depending on what, what they're with. So basically C and G are the two big ones, right? OK, um, Colin, what do you say about incorporating a gesture for every letter sound? OK, I know what you mean by that, where a lot of um, uh, teachers would do something like they would say ah or b and they would use a they would use a hand gesture or a sound or something like that or they might go ah, ah, apple 
right? And this is my action for Apple, right? A gesture. Um, it's okay. It's, it's a teaching technique. It's useful in a sense. But the thing I always say with that, and I do use them a lot. I do use a lot of gestures or actions with what I teach. But at some stage, I say to the kids, that was just for practice. Now, sit on your hands. I just want you to speak or read or, or decode, right? Um, I don't want you doing that all the time. Right. So I don't want you going out and saying, how are you sort of I don't you know, when you're talking or reading, I don't want you doing gestures all the time. They're a tool. OK, but they're not something you should keep all the time. Um, Colin, if you want to talk more about that, just drop me an email. We can chat about that a bit more. OK. Good one. Um, good. Oh, Brendan's here. Brendan uh, in the chat box. Just so you know, Brendan, uh, Brendan Bolton, he is actually the person kind of from Nelson who's helping us uh, in Asia work with Nelson Decodable Readers. Hi, Brendan. Thank, nice for joining us today. Um, I hope I said everything correctly. I didn't say anything wrong. Uh, but as Brendan says, 388 Nelson Decodable Readers in total. Uh, there's a lot to work with there. OK. Uh, Lillian's asking, how can people contact me? All of you received the email about this webinar. It has my email address there. It's andrew.tiffany at Um, Drop me an email. That's the easiest way to do that. Uh, Lillian uh, is asking, uh, if you try and have students decode a reader on their own, yes, but that's the end of the process, right? Um, we've got a lot of work to do to get the students building up their, their phone, uh, phonemic awareness and phonetic abilities to get to that stage, high frequency words and all the rest, right? Um, I wouldn't make them do too much on their own the first time. If, if I carefully know the reader, and I know, actually, they know 100% of this. I am certain they know 100% of the phonemes and high-frequency words in here. I'd let them try, right? I'm not going to assess them on it, probably, right? I'm not going to give them that first reading, that's your assessment kind of thing. Um, but I would let them try, sure. Um, it would also be about their emotional state. These are usually younger students, and I would be careful about if it, if it makes them upset because they don't feel like they can do it, that whole social emotional aspect of the learner, I would be strongly taking into account um, if I try to get them to decode something like on their own like that. So I hope that gives you an answer there, Lillian. Okay. Uh, Diep Fam asked, can you tell us again uh, who said we learn to read once? I've heard that from our authors. I'm not sure where they've picked that phrase from, but they're all like, you know, PhDs and professors and stuff like that. I would I, I don't know exactly where they got it from, but if you think about reading the idea of turning text into sound and meaning, that idea, that concept, we only have to learn that once. It's not like the idea of taking characters in Chinese and turning it into meaning is different from the idea of taking characters in English and turning it into meaning, or characters in some other language that uses the same sort of alphabet, but isn't English, like German, right? There is meaning associated with text. That idea of learning to read, we learn once. But then, different reading systems, yeah, that's different each time. Okay? Good. Okay. Um, Lillian, so you said, I'm wondering, because there's a lot of memorization in Japan, not much phonics at all. Uh, I think So that's going back to would you get students to try and decode readers by themselves? That's where, oh, that was the thing I didn't mention, um, was I did say something about what happens if the kids are just looking around and they're memorized the book and they're just saying, what would you do about that? What ideas would you have for breaking that memorization cycle? If the students have a reader, but actually they're not reading it, they're just, they've just memorized the text. What would you do in the chat box? Let me know. I've got a couple of things that I do, but let's see. Oh, there you go. Anderson, 2003. Thank you, Will. Good. Concept check. Okay, good. Yep. Uh, so uh, my, I'm mispronouncing your name. I know Mutu um, is asking if all words can be decoded. No. Okay. All words have phonemes. Okay. But... The some words don't follow a regular phonetic code. Okay. An example is the word the, okay, versus the word thin. They both have the same th, but it's a different phoneme. Okay. Um, so some words are easily decoded, some words 
consist of phonemes, but there's inconsistencies. Um, so yeah, you have to be careful about what you say um, with different words. Okay. Okay. Uh, Erwin, assessing phonic skills. Basically, if my students can do the tasks that I ask them to do, that's my assessment. Can they look at the word and pronounce it? Can they? That remember that chart I showed earlier. If they can do those different things, those are the kind of tasks I use for assessment. But if you want to talk more about that, let me know. We can have a bit of a chat about that too. Okay. Very good. Okay, so in the chat box, people were saying things like about breaking that um, uh, memorization cycle for reading. Switch to something silly. Uh, Catherine, I do kind of the same thing. I get my students to read texts backwards. Um, so if I switch to the book again, uh, I think I've still got the book up here somewhere. So if I'm on a page of the book, go back here. Okay, so I might get the kids to read this backwards. Mum said pup the wins Kim. Kim got mum. OK, right. So I might get my students to read backwards. Uh, I might also get my students to read every second word. Got, him, mm, the, mm, said, mm, right? Um, something like that. Uh, and uh, I might say, just read all the words that have an M. So mum, Kim, mum. Kim, right? Um, I might do that sort of thing because that's breaking the cycle and forcing the students to look at the words and look at the page right? Uh, and that's one way to do it, okay? Yeah, reading backwards, as Will said, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, uh, and it, and it, these, these are things I've picked up from other teachers. I didn't come up with these. I've stolen them all from other teachers, right? So, yeah, okay? Very good. So I hope that's been useful today. Thanks for joining us. Uh, if I just jump back here, do uh, join our uh, Facebook or other groups where you can keep in touch with us. Drop us an email if you want to. Uh, we will send you the recording in the email tomorrow. Thanks for all your questions. I do realize I ran over time answering things, but that's the nature of when I do webinars, I guess. But do enjoy. Thank you for all your feedback, and we look forward to seeing you soon. If you have people uh, you know who wanted to see this webinar, you can give them the recording. Uh, that you will get tomorrow. We're also, I'm also doing another session uh, in about seven hours from now. Uh, the link to register for that is on the webinar's website. So if you know someone else and you're saying, go along and see this webinar, then get them to sign up uh, for the session later on today. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. We look forward to seeing you soon and do register for uh, Don Clyde and Derek's session, which is in the middle of April. And we'll see you again real soon. Thank you, everyone.